Live from Bryant-Denny Stadium with special guests, feature stories, and a comprehensive look at Alabama's upcoming game, it's Crimson Tide Kickoff on WVUA 23. Brought to you by Alpha. What I remember from it, all right, is we got the line and kicked out of our britches. I don't know if you know what that means, but that means you get your butt kicked so bad you got no seam in the back of your pants. That's one way to describe it. It was certainly a game to forget for Alabama fans back in 2010. A two touchdown loss the last time Alabama went to Columbia, South Carolina, and it certainly left an impression on Coach Saban. Good morning, everybody. I'm Gary Harris, welcoming you into another edition of Crimson Tide Kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance. I'm in our studio here in Tuscaloosa inside the Digital Media Center in Bryant Denny Stadium, but we're also on the ground in Columbia, South Carolina. We got a great show guest analysis, feature stories, and uh, those guests include Alabama soccer standout Taylor Morgan and also a look behind enemy lines, so to speak, when current American Christian head coach and former South Carolina quarterback Chris Smelly joins me here in studio as well. Let's take a look at where we are. As I said, I'm inside the WVUA 23 studios in the Digital Media Center in Bryant-Denny Stadium. Joining me here in Tuscaloosa, CTKO's Daniel Davis, who will give us the most up-to-date game day weather forecast, both here for West Alabama and for what's happening up there in Columbia, South Carolina, which is where our crew of Zach Tigert and Alessandra Potbriand are standing by to bring you the latest from the sand hills of the Palmetto State. We'll be joined by them later on in the show, so let's just get going as we start off, as always, with our Bama headlines. For the latest on the Crimson Tide, you don't need the newspaper. You need Bama headlines. And one of the biggest headlines of the week was the kickoff time for Alabama and Southern Miss when it was announced for next Saturday. The game is set for an 11 a.m. kick much to the chagrin of Alabama fans who feel as if the Tide doesn't get an opportunity to play enough games under the lights at Bryant-Denny Stadium, especially with those new LED lights. Athletics Director Greg Byrne and University of Alabama President Stuart Bell felt so strongly about it, they released a statement on the matter, which in short said that Alabama leads the SEC in day games played in September since 2014 and that they're disappointed with the 11 a.m. kickoff slot for next weekend. And even though it's nearly a uh, decade since these two teams met on the gridiron, there's at least one familiar foe on the other sideline for Alabama. That's South Carolina running back Tavian Feaster. Today will mark the fourth straight season that the Gamecock tailback has faced Alabama because he spent the first three seasons of his career playing for the Clemson Tigers. More on Tavian Feaster later on in the show. And so far this season, Alabama's committee of young freshman defenders has looked impressive. They look like a veteran unit for the most part. They've been earning high praise in practice as well, and they're beginning to take on leadership roles too. We'll have details on these standout freshmen coming up on CTKO. And here's a look at the series history between these two. All time, Bama leads the series 12 to 3 on the field heading into the 16th matchup. And Alabama's 5 and 3 since the Gamecocks joined the Southeastern Conference in 1992. Officially, after vacancies and forfeits, it's 10 to 4. In Columbia, these two have met only five times, but Bama holds the advantage there as well with a 3 2 record on the road. But of course, as we mentioned earlier, the last time the Tide went to Williams Bryce Stadium, the outcome was not good. So Carolina has the upper hand in terms of a current win streak against the Tide. And speaking of that matchup, let's revisit as painful as it was. Quarterback Steven Garcia was lights out. He was never that good before or after, but on that day, he was 17 of 20 for 201 yards and three touchdowns. Marcus Lattimore had a day himself, 93 yards and a pair of scores on the ground, and Bama had no answer for Alshon Jeffrey. The wide, long, rangy wide receiver went off in the game. Seven receptions, 127 yards, and two touchdowns, and the Tide could not answer. It was 29-21-9 at half, and in the end, the Gamecocks pulled the upset, snapping Alabama's 19-game winning streak, 35-21. to But that game is long in the past, nearly a decade ago, ago, in fact, and this season is much different for both teams. For South Carolina, they're riding a bit of a momentum swing, coming off a big win over Charleston Southern last weekend, in which the Gamecocks were forced to turn to freshman quarterback Ryan Holinsky and replace uh, of the injured Jake Bentley. We'll have more on Holinsky 
coming up. But going back to last week, the Gamecocks looked sharp, especially after falling in week one in North Carolina. They scored on 11 of 13 possessions, scoring 10 touchdowns as they trounced Charleston Southern 72 to 10. It was also the first game since 2011 that South Carolina didn't have a single negative play nor a single punt. Head coach Will Muschamp entering his fourth season in Columbia, and Nick Saban knows Muschamp's teams always come ready to play. We certainly look forward to uh, the SEC um, opener you know, this week. Uh, Will Muschamp has done an outstanding job of building a very, very good program in South Carolina. They had a successful season a year ago. Uh, they're a very well-coached team in every phase of the game. Uh, their guys play hard. Uh, they sort of reflect the personality of their coach. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is a good football team. And on the flip side, Muschamp and the entire South Carolina football squad, well, they know what they're up against. Alabama's the number two team in the country. And the Tide has looked apart this season with convincing wins over Duke and New Mexico State. Alabama is a monster, but head coach Will Muschamp says you can't approach a game like this any differently than you approach the other games. But you got to beat Alabama. And at the end of the day, John, they're not going to beat themselves. They're, they're well coached. They've got good players. Uh, but you've got to go beat Alabama. You've got to have an aggressive mindset when you go into the ball game. You've got to do the simple things really well in the game. And you can't start trying to play out of what you normally do. At the end of the day, there's going to be four to six plays in this game that are going to determine the outcome of the game, just like every other game we play. And we've got to outwork this football team for 60 minutes and be in position in those four to six plays to win the game. And that's, that's no different than any other game. And don't treat it any different than any other game. And, of course, today is the SEC opener for both teams. Under Nick Saban, Alabama is 11-1 in SEC road openers. That's impressive. And 13-4 and all time during his season in the SEC with LSU and Alabama combined. Additionally, in all SEC road games, Saban doesn't skip a beat, holding a 41-7 record in Southeastern Conference road games. That's unbelievable. It really is when you think about how tough this league is. So it's uh, needless to say, Coach Saban always makes sure the tide is ready to roll, and when conference play comes around, it's even more so. It's one of the most exciting times during the football season when the games really begin to matter the most, and the Alabama players seem to have their mind right when the game kicks off. CTKO's Alessandra Potbrian joins us live now in Columbia with more on the preparation and mindset that Alabama has heading into this SEC opener. Alessandra? Gary, in 2010, South Carolina was ranked 19th. In Alabama, they were the current national champions and atop the polls. Now, the Crimson Tide was on a 19-game winning streak coming into that game against South Carolina in williams Bryce Stadium. But I don't want to spoil the next story, but what Tide fans may remember is disappointing. Nine years ago, the Alabama football team traveled to Columbia, South Carolina. The Gamecocks beat the top-ranked Crimson Tide 35-21. to October 9, 2010 was the last time these two teams competed. But this afternoon, they will face each other once again back in williams Bryce Stadium. We got South Carolina this week. They're a great team, but we should have the same mindset. We go in every other game. Um, just want to go out there and dominate each and every opponent. Alabama head coach Nick Saban is 11 and 1 in SEC road openers. He's ready to go up against his former LSU defensive coordinator and against one of the few teams to beat Saban during his time at Alabama. Now we got to play and compete for 60 minutes a game and go play a complete game on the road in the SEC, uh, which we have a lot of respect for, you know, South Carolina's team, Will Champ, Must Champ and his program. Uh, the way they play, the discipline that they play with. Uh, they're a good team, and I think it's really important that when you play a team that relies on execution, trying to do things correctly and playing with discipline, that you have to you know, match you know, their intensity as well as their mental disposition. Most of the Alabama players were too young to remember the 2010 game. Current players like defensive back Patrick Sertain aren't worried about the past because they are looking towards Saturday afternoon. Games like that, you know, we we rarely focus on them because we know there's a new challenge upon us, and uh, we're not going to reflect on that game because we just focus on this game coming up and uh, we'll be going, how we're going to conquer it and how we're going, you know, prepare for it. 
Road games in the SEC can be daunting for some teams because of the high level of competition, but that isn't scaring the Crimson Tide. Oh, I think it's a different, different mindset, different ball game, because uh, of course SEC ball uh, is more hard. Uh, you know, it's it's more intense. Um, so we got to make sure that we're, we're prepared and ready, which we'll do. The Crimson Tide and the Gamecocks will meet for the 16th time in series history. While Alabama leads 12 to 3 in the series, none of those games matter. What matters is this afternoon in Columbia. Like you just heard, Alabama players are not worried about the last meeting between these two teams. And what I'm excited for is to see South Carolina play and see if they can recreate the same outcome from 2010. Reporting live in South Carolina, I'm Alessandra Pomprion. Thank you, Alice Hunter. Interesting piece, to say the least. Well, we're certainly ready for conference play here at CTKO. And based on the temperatures outside, as per usual, it's going to be a hot, hot SEC opener, uh, both here in Tuscaloosa and Alabama, as well as up in Columbia. We expect nothing less here in the southeast this time of the year. It's steamy. CTKO's Daniel Davis joins us now with a look at the game day forecast. Danielle, it's going to be another rough one, heat-wise. Yes, Gary. Right now, feels like temperatures already in the 90s here in Tuscaloosa. 92 is what it feels like if you step outdoors right now. Jasper feels like 96. And you're not going to see any relief this afternoon because the sun is going to be beating down. Dry over central Alabama right now, but as you move into the later evening hours, we are going to start to see a few pop-up showers and thunderstorms move into the area, but most areas will stay dry for the afternoon, and those will start to clear by Saturday 11 p.m., so hopefully celebrating a tide victory here in T-Town. Your game forecast, we're looking at kickoff temperatures in the mid-90s, and by the end of the game, we are not cooling down much, only in the low 90s. That's your forecast. Thank you, Danielle. Good news is, if you know, you want to go to the sauna, <laughs> just step outside for a little bit. You'll break a sweat. Well, coming up here on Crimson Tide Kickoff, we have a lot more to do when we come back. An in-depth look at what's different about Tua this year and how he's looking to improve on a Heisman runner-up campaign from a year ago. Plus, if he isn't already, new Alabama offensive lineman Landon Dickerson is sure to be a Crimson Tide fan favorite. He's got an edge to him. And we'll get to know him a little bit more when Crimson Tide kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance returns right here only on WVUA 23. Let's take a glance at the latest AP Top 25. Clemson and Alabama, 
lead the pack at one and two. Georgia comes in at three, but some moving and shaking at the top as well. LSU joins the top five following their thrilling victory of the Longhorns last weekend in Austin. The Bayou Bengals check it at number four, and Oklahoma comes in at number five. Ohio State, Notre Dame, Auburn, Florida, and Michigan round out the top ten. For teams 10 through 20, the Longhorns drop to 12, but dropping even further, Texas A&M, after the Aggies were shut down by Clemson, they check in at number 16. As for the bottom five in the top 25, so they're really not bottom, they're just bottom of the pole. Look at Coach Mike Loxley's Maryland Terrapins. The former Bama OC leads his team in the top 25 this week at number 21. Boise State, Washington, Southern Cal, and Virginia round out this week's AP Top 25. And welcome back into CTKO presented by Alpha Insurance. I'm Gary Harris live inside WVUA 23's studios located in the Digital Media Center in Bryant Denny Stadium. Well, Alabama will be taking on a freshman quarterback this afternoon, a true freshman, which has, of course, pros and cons. True freshman Ryan Helensky, brother of the late Washington State quarterback Tyler Helensky, stepped up for South Carolina last week when Jake Bentley went down with a foot sprain against North Carolina in the first game. On one side of the coin, Helensky's young and experienced, perhaps prone to mistakes. But on the other side of that coin, they don't have a lot of film to study on the young gunslinger in order to learn his tendencies, and he is really good. But what little tape there is of Helensky, as I said, is impressive. He led the Gamecocks to a convincing victory over Charleston Southern last week in which South Carolina scored 10 touchdowns. Needless to say, Alabama head coach Nick Saban was impressed. He certainly didn't look like a freshman quarterback out there. He's a good athlete. He's got a good arm. He was very accurate. He made good decisions. He got rid of the ball. He got the ball out of his hand quickly. Uh, and he executed the offense extremely well. So, um, you know, I, no, no disrespect because we think, you know, Bentley is a really good quarterback and certainly experienced guy, but they didn't miss a beat, you know, in this game in terms of the quarterback position. On the other sideline, the Crimson Tide not lacking in experience under center. Junior Tua Tagovailoa is entering his second year as a starter, and he has plenty, and I mean plenty, of accolades and experience under his belt. Despite all this, Bama has room for improvement in the passing game. The stats might not have shown it last week, but Tua wasn't at his best against New Mexico State, and Coach Saban is eager to uh, clean things up a little bit. I don't think we were real crisp in the passing game. I'm not talking about any fault of Tua's, but just, you know, sort of sloppy in protection, sloppy in route running, um, just, you know, calling seven-man protections and getting too much pressure in the pocket. I mean, we just got a lot of things to clean up in the passing game. So even when you're considered one of the best in the country, there's still room for improvement. That's what's great about football. That's certainly how Alabama is looking at things, and it's also how Tua is looking at things in regards to himself. Last year's Heisman Trophy runner-up wasn't going to be good enough in 2019 for this guy. In week one, Tua won't be good enough in week three, and so on and so forth. He's looking to improve every week, every game. CTKO's Haley Wiggum explains how and why Tua Tagovailoa is able to keep getting better and better. In the eyes of many Crimson Tide football fans, Alabama quarterback Tua Tungavailoa is one of the best in the game. But in the eyes of head coach Nick Saban, there is always room for improvement. Uh, I, I think that um, he's more confident in understanding not only what to do, but why it's important to do it. And I think he's got a lot more knowledge of what the defense is actually trying to do and how they'll respond and react to certain things. When it comes to growth, specifically in the passing game, Tua says it starts with a plan that is decided in practice and continues on the sideline. Taking that coaching on the sideline and kind of transferring it to the field, you know, because I, I can see one thing that we're, we're going over in practice throughout the week, and then sometimes they, I mean, they can change what they've been doing, and so making adjustments on the fly is, is something that I need to do. The passing game isn't the only thing improving on the Tide's offense. Wide receiver Jerry Judy says his connection with his quarterback has grown a lot from last season. So we have a lot of understanding with each other um, during the games. You know, he sees things uh, that he wants me to do better, and I tell him things that I, that I see on the field that we can improve on so we can make plays. Tua will have the chance to prove himself once again this afternoon against South Carolina in Alabama's first SEC game of the season. For Crimson Tide Kickoff, I'm Haley Wiggum. 
Thanks, Haley. Well, there's one new member of the Crimson Tide in particular who I've really enjoyed watching so far. He's huge. I mean, he's he's huge, literally, and he's got a huge personality, too. He comes across as a authentic individual, a guy who tells you what he's thinking. Florida State grad transfer Landon Dickerson has come a long way in his brief time as a member of the Crimson Tide's offensive line, and he's already one of the boys and is well on his way to becoming a fan favorite, too. CTKO's Julia Daniels explains. Through a punch at Dickerson. Alabama fans got their first real look at Landon Dickerson when he waved goodbye to the Duke defensive tackle Edgar Serenord after he was ejected for stomping on the tied lineman. Some people let get things get in their head and you know if that happens I mean, it happens and you know I just really enjoy what I do. He's a big personality fitting for his big body which is getting its fair share of rotation on the line. He was at guard against Duke, but he played center last week against New Mexico State. Up until Saturday, I had not played a game at center in high school or college. So going in there, you know, I just thought of myself as a guy who's going to get the job done. You know, we're trying to put the best five on the field, and, you know, we were working with what we had Saturday, and that's what we did. Out of high school, Dickerson had looked at Alabama, but ultimately chose Florida State because he felt it was a better fit at the time. But he says that Alabama is better suited for him now. Um, I mean, I, I don't really want to speak anything negative. Florida State's a great school. It's filled with great people and great coaches. You know, I just here fit my personality a little better. You know, I wanted to keep my head down and just I try to do what coach told me to do and just come out every day with a great attitude and practice hard. And, you know, it, it's paying off right now and hopefully I'll keep it up and it keeps paying off the rest of the year. For Crimson Tide Kickoff, I'm Julia Daniels. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, he certainly had an edge to him. I, I really like this guy. Well, we're not anywhere close to the finish line on Crimson Tide Kickoff. When we return, our first guest Live in the studio will join us this morning. He should be a familiar face to both Alabama and South Carolina fans. Former Gamecock quarterback and current American Christian football coach Chris Melly will join us live in the studio. That's next when CTKO returns here on WVUA 23. Take it all the way, potentially. I mean, potentially, but in the in the playoffs, there are uh, oh yeah, there's a bunch of really good ones. Mike, check Chris. Mike, check. Am on? Am I good? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? That sound okay? Spot. You need to come come over. Yeah, just right. And we're back on Crimson Tide Kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance. I'm Gary Harris. It's guest time in the studio and excited about having Chris Smelly. Chris, hey, glad to be here, Because it's Bama versus South Carolina. And you talk about unique perspective. You don't really think about Bama and South Carolina being rivals in the traditional sense in the SEC because they're not. Haven't played that many times. But this guy 
played at American Christian Academy, set records that still stand today in the AHSAA. Uh, probably wanted to go to Alabama at the time. Mike Shula, you know, for whatever reason, just didn't get on the same page with him, but you got on the same page with Steve Spurrier. And you wound up going to South Carolina, and you're still in the top ten in several categories there, even after just playing three years, but you wound up transferring and finishing at Alabama. So yeah. my question is, you were already here back in Tuscaloosa in 2010. That's right. In that game up there, who were you pulling for? <clears throat> well, you know, my brother Brad was still playing too. Yeah. And uh, so I was actually at the game. Okay. And uh, up there watching them was kind of my first time to be back. It was actually my first South Carolina football game to ever go to and sit yeah. in the stands. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of had my allegiances to both sides uh, there with the, with the family with Alabama and, and then kind of being back at Alabama and then also just having my time in South Carolina. So, you know, it was, it was kind of tough. I, th I think I wore like a, a plain gray T-shirt that yeah. game. <laughs> it was crazy up there. Uh, I was there too, and I tell people all the time, and I've been to Baton Rouge, of course, many times, Auburn, Athens, Knoxville. That day in that stadium, with that football team, it was as tough an atmosphere for Alabama as I've ever seen. That place was electric. Williams Bryce gets loud, and it's a, it's a it's a unique stadium, and the fans love their South Carolina football. And uh, yeah, no doubt. Uh, I, I was kind of talking to Brad before they're going up that game. I said, man, this is going to be a tough environment, something y'all hadn't faced in a while, and uh, and I knew it was going to be a, a tight game. You know, I didn't expect what happened to happen the way it did, but. Uh, yeah, it's a great, great football game. Yeah, Bama had won 19 in a row defending national champions, so I know you're happy for, for South Carolina. I know you're disappointed for Brad because that, right. that was a tough one for Alabama. All right, you get asked this a lot, but playing for Steve Spurrier uh, is something special. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, it's certainly an up-and-down relationship. Yeah. You had some huge games there, um, had some, as I said, put up some gigantic numbers, but like a lot of his quarterbacks, you were in the lineup, you were out of the lineup. Uh, what was it like? Yeah, I mean, I always kind of tell people it's, it's sort of like what you see is what you get. You know, it, it's kind of like the personality that he has on the sidelines is kind of just him, you know. And so, uh, you know, there, there were some ups and downs and some in and outs, kind of like a lot of Spurrier quarterbacks have, uh, have faced. But, I mean, I tell you what, overall, the, the three years that I was out South Carolina, was, it was uh, just a great time and made lifelong friends and, yeah. and guys I still keep in touch with today. And so, you know, there were, there were some – some challenges at different times, but, you know, the, it's kind of looking back, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, we're looking at some clips now of, of you, when you were when you were playing. Um, favorite moments? I know, you, you know, you came in as a freshman. You were SEC Freshman of the Week right off the bat. In your second year, you became the starter, you know, beating out Mitchell. Uh, any games, any moments that, that stand out to you as a, as a Gamecock that come right to the, to the top of your head? Um, Man, we, we had a big game uh, at Mississippi uh, at Ole Miss. Um, I can't remember the year, maybe 2009. And uh, it was the game right after they had beat Tim Tebow in Florida. Mm -hmm. Florida was ranked number one. And it was kind of that famous Tim Tebow mm -hmm. post-game speech game. And, and so playing Ole Miss the next week after they had just knocked off number one Florida. And, uh, and we came out as at Ole Miss and played really well and, and got a win. That was, that was a pretty special game. Yeah, you threw for a ton of yards. In that game, do you remember yeah, how many it was? It was three eighty four something like that? I mean, three hundred something yards. Yeah, yeah. Big and game. Uh, yeah, and, and it was kind of a back and forth game, and um, made a, a bunch of big plays down the stretch. All right, Ryan Olinsky gets to start today. Now he lit it up against Charleston Southern, but this is Alabama. Uh, kind of handicap this matchup today between Alabama and South Carolina. How do you think it's going to go? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I haven't been able to watch him a ton, but I know Holinsky's a great quarterback, and coming out of high school is is highly rated and a super talented guy, very athletic quarterback, which. You know, sometimes it's, it's maybe been one of the things that can get at Alabama just a little bit. Um, but, you know, I mean, 2010 was, was a long time ago, and, um, and, and, you know, both programs have kind of gone through a lot since then. So, uh, you know, I, th I think it would be a, a tall task for the Gamecocks to, to beat Alabama today. All right, so I said you started at South Carolina, you finished at Bama. Who are you pulling for today? Man, I, I don't, I'm not really, not really pulling for either side. <laughs> a you good know? game? Yeah, I, I've got my ties to both sides. Man, I'm, I'm pulling for my ACA Patriots most of the time. That's my, that's my number one hey. team I'm pulling for. And, uh, and just enjoy watching some college hey. football. And ACA is <laughs> rolling. We tell you that. They are playing great, great football. Thanks, Chris, for coming on. We enjoyed it. Thank and you, when we return to CTKO here on WVA 23, we're going back up to Columbia where the tide was tamed nearly a decade ago. And we're going to find out just what exactly the players remember from 2010. Remember, they were in grade school. CTKO presented by Alpha Insurance will return right after this timeout.
Well, it, of course, Brian, I think, worked on a theory you took ordinary people and made them extraordinary. We were, uh, we're doing a drill, which was actually a three-on-one drill, where a defensive lineman got down his four-point stance. Really a real difficult play, and this boy was not doing it. Coach Bryant had, in those days, had a megaphone. And whenever he got ready to say anything, you could hear it click. And when you heard it click, grown men paled, because he was coming after somebody. Again, we heard the click of the megaphone, but we looked up, and actually, Coach Bryant was coming down. And he questioned a lot of things about the boy and his heritage and a lot, a lot of things. But he got his attention, and the boy starts actually almost crying. He, he got emotional, and Coach Brown hugged him and said, I know you can do this. Well, the boy got down, and I remember his eyes looked like little ball bearings. And he was quivering, and sweat was dropping straight off of it. And his eyes looked like he was in a zone. He split the double team, knocked the fullback cold as a wedge, makes the tackle behind line scrimmage. And he looked up, Coach Bryant was walking on the field. He went to him and said, is that what you want? And Coach Bryant said, you don't understand, son. That's what you got to do every time. I never forget that. The boy left, by the way, and uh, played in the pros for a while. That's one of the most enjoyable parts of putting together this show every week is listening to Mr. Eddie Conyers recall some of his best stories. Mr. Conyers, truly an Alabama legend. Welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance. I'm Zach Tiger, live just outside of williams Bryce Stadium here in Columbia, South Carolina. We're about, the, about at the three-hour mark away from kickoff between the Tide and the Gamecocks. Well, most older Bama fans remember 2010's loss here at williams Bryce Stadium. It was a tough pill to swallow, a year removed from a national title title and they came in as the number one team in the country but most of the 2019 Alabama roster were in grade school they don't remember 2010 they don't remember anything about that game as you're about to see what year are we in now 2019 so most of our guys were in grade school you know when that happened I don't remember that game. I was like sure, sure. 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> to be exact, they were in middle school. Um, I probably was in seventh grade. Um, I think that's when I started playing football. 2010 was so long ago that this year's reigning Blitnikoff winner wasn't even a full-time receiver. I played running back, DN, safety, and a little bit of receiver. But even nine years ago, Tua Tungavailoa had the same goal in mind, winning a championship. I think I was in seventh grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Seventh, like 12. Yeah, so seventh grade. Okay. I think I was in seventh grade. And I was, last memory I think is, I was playing for, for like a, a, a championship, like <laughs> when I was, How's that, that little? And Tua hopes to be playing in another championship game in 2020, which, as he points out, is closer than it seems. 2010, that, that's a long time from now, you know, so it's almost 2020. Almost is. You know? <laughs> And I remember 2010. In fact, I was a junior in high school. Now I'm 25, married with a kid on the way. So time certainly flies. And hopefully this commercial break does as well. Because when we return to CTKO, we'll have another edition of The Burn Point with UA Athletic Director Greg Byrne. You don't want to miss that. Live in Columbia, South Carolina, I'm Zach Tiger. Crimson Tide Kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance continues after this break.
You're watching Crimson Tide Kickoff on WVUA 23. Welcome in to this week's edition of The Burn Point. I'm Gary Harris, joined by Alabama Director of Athletics, Greg Byrne, and we are going to talk softball this week. Uh, it's one of the best programs in the country. We've got one of the best coaching staffs, headed by Patrick Murphy. You've got Olympians and so many international players that are either that have either played here or are playing here now. Right. Quite a program. But some big news happening. Uh, the renovations to the Rose House are already underway, and Alabama is hosting the 2020 SEC tournament. And these things don't come around but every 13 years. Correct. 13 teams that play softball. This is a big, big deal and a big event coming up next spring. It is. For, first and foremost, like you said, Patrick Murphy, the job that he has done at for our softball program, for our university, is outstanding. He's 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 a great guy. He's a wonderful coach. His kids are loyal to him. They play their tails off for him. It's it's just a, it's such a healthy, good program. And so, when we were working on the Crimson Standard and prioritizing what we were doing, uh, you know, obviously the Rhodes House is is, is an outstanding facility, uh, but you need to continue to evolve in what takes place. And so. I told, I told Coach Murphy, I said, you're going to be one of the priorities in phase one. And obviously, we have 21 sports. We have 650 student athletes. That's hard to, you know, how does that impact other programs? But because of the job that he's done, there's great support amongst our entire coaching staff and our department of saying that was a priority for us and what takes place. And at the same time, I also told him, I said, listen, um, they'll, people will continue to evolve in what takes place, and we have to make this work within our resources that we have to work with and, and we're fortunate where we um, have a healthy budget. We've been fortunate from a f fundraising standpoint, um, but we need to make sure we continue to reinvest in the program that we have, and that's what we were doing with Road Stadium. Nice improvements for our fans. Along that first baseline, we're going to add new concessions, new new uh, restrooms, uh, some shaded area that hasn't been there before up on the concourse. That'll be some nice fan amenities. We're going to update the press box uh, for you and your <laughs> peers. That's pretty tight right now. Uh, and then we're also going to uh, uh, go down to our clubhouse and do renovations there and update that area. And that will be great from a student athlete experience standpoint. That'll be great from a recruiting standpoint for us as too. So we're we're very pleased about what that's going to mean. And then. We'll have that ready for the SEC softball tournament that we're hosting here in the spring of 2020. Yeah, and I sense the reason there's so much excitement, not all, but the majority of conference tournaments are held at neutral sites. Right. Uh, for softball, the other 12 schools come here. You're showing off your university. It's a buzz that you get when you go to a neutral site conference of tournament event I'm not saying you don't have that but right. to be on your campus I think that's one reason Murph is so pumped up about this yeah absolutely and and the passion our softball fans have is really second to none and uh, so this will be this will showcase our softball program it's going to showcase our fan base and, and I, I know when there'll be two other teams playing Kentucky and Florida maybe playing a game together just throwing them, them out There'll be a lot of crimson in the stands watching that game because of how much our fan base loves college softball. And, and that goes back again to the incredible job that, that Murph has done uh, leading that program during his time here. We often talk about football and all the national championships, but you've got other sports. And I know that's a big pitch for you when you're talking to potential donors or talking to athletes that are being recruited here is that we can compete for championships in all sports. Softball is proof of that national championship program. Yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously, 25 years ago, we didn't have any history really in, in, in that. So to see it build to where it is, people want to be at Alabama. Uh, it's such a special place. Let's take advantage of that. And Murphy has shown that. Jay Sewell has shown that. Mick Potter has shown that. Our gymnastics program has shown that. Other the improvements we've made in track and field under Dan Waters. You know, we're knocking on the door for national championships. That's that's what we want to do, and and we won't apologize for it. Let's go out, let's do it the right way, but let's go out and be competitive and compete for championships in what we do. There's a sign at the Rhodes House that says the best softball fans in the country. They will be on display for the entire Southeastern Conference and the nation to see in the spring of 2020 when Alabama hosts the SEC softball tournament. For Greg Byrne, I'm Gary Harris. This has been the Burn Point.
Welcome back to CTKO presented by Alpha Insurance. It's smooth sailing here in Tuscaloosa inside our WVOA 23 studios in the Digital Media Center in Brighton Beach Stadium. That's because we're here at home, but Alabama will be facing a much tougher environment this afternoon in Columbia. The Tide will be greeted by the Gamecock faithful in their signature song, Sandstorm. And with the number two team in the country in town to visit, it's going to be even louder than usual. williams Bryce Stadium is known to be an intimidating place to play, and the crowd noise will be a big part in this one. But the players say they're prepared for the hostile environment. I heard it was pretty loud. Um, of course, I don't know. I've never really uh, been there as far as, like, uh, game-wise goes. Uh, you know, I, I went there on a visit, but I didn't go there when it was actually, like, a game. So, um, but I actually have heard it's, it's really loud. Yeah, I say, like, past experience, you know, we play, a, we play a lot of away games, loud teams, LSU, Tennessee. We played a away games that's pretty loud. But, uh, you know, that's how, like, most of the environment going to be. So we just got to focus on what we got to do to win, win the game. You know, it really just makes everybody hone in on communication and making sure that we're listening to the calls, we're getting the calls, and everybody's on the same page. It's no secret that Alabama has its share of youth on this team, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. Bama has two starting inside linebackers who are true freshmen. A stud freshman nose tackle, D.J. Dale, along with a host of young defensive backs, including Jordan Battle, these youngins have not only been impressive in the eyes of the fans, but they've caught the attention of their teammates as well. <laughs> They're definitely uh, get, starting to get comfortable and starting to kind of play fast and, you know what I'm saying, just more so play like, not play robot, like robots, basically. So definitely getting comfortable and making calls and being able to just play, play freely. I mean, you know, they play very well, you know, they, you know, play it as far as defense wise just making plays you know making plays on the ball you know tackling you know they did very well out there and it's going to be a lot of fun watching these young football players uh, continue to impress and develop over the course of this season well Alabama and South Carolina may be the game of the week in the Southeastern Conference but this isn't the only game with SEC teams in action CTKO's Alessandra Potbriand joins us again from Columbia for a look around the SEC Alessandra Gary, there's only one other conference matchup today, and the remainder of the SEC, they're tackling out-of-conference matchups. A few games already underway. Arkansas State is in Athens taking on the Georgia Bulldogs. A Big 12 SEC matchup. Kansas State is in Starkville taking on Mississippi State. And perhaps one of the most intriguing games in the league, Chattanooga is in Knoxville and looking to become the next small school to take down the Bulls on Rocky Top. And then at 3 o'clock, call the Hogs. The Razorbacks host Colorado State up in Fayetteville. Also at 3, southeastern Louisiana heads north to Oxford, Mississippi to take on the Ole Miss Rebels. Then at 6 p.m., the only other SEC matchup, Florida travels to the Bluegrass State to face the Kentucky Wildcats. Also at 6, Kent State on the Plains taking on Auburn. Of course, Gus Malzahn watches. It was an 11 a.m. kick, but oh well. And Lamar will be facing the 12th man at Kyle Field as they draw the Aggies in week number three. Finally, pair of 630 kicks. Northwest. Western State is down on the Bayou facing LSU in Baton Rouge and Southeast Missouri State will face Missouri in the other Columbia. So this week's slate of games around the conference won't do much for the SEC rankings, but there's still a ton of great games to watch all around the SEC. Back to you, Gary. And thank you, Alessandra. Around the WVA 23 studios, we found ourselves another guest and she's going to be a good one. She's the heart and soul of the Alabama women's soccer team. Taylor Morgan joins me in studio when Crimson Tide kickoff returns here on WVUA 23. I'd be on camera, otherwise I would have dressed nicer. I thought it was a radio hey, talk show. This is a TV show. <laughs> you know what? Hey, how are you? Good, how you are you? You look like a soccer player. That's <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh, I sure uh, do. I probably smell like one, too. They should have told you that it was TV, but that's just, but you look great. You're oh, fine. thank you, you thank you. Be, you know, you <laughs> sporty. Like you're all dressed up. Uh, mic check, please, Taylor. Just talk. Hello. Just count to five. One, two, three, four, gotcha. five. Gotcha. Yeah, good. We've got North Texas.
And welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance. I'm Gary Harris and joining me in studio is an outstanding University of Alabama soccer player, junior midfielder, Taylor Morgan from Westfield, New Jersey is with us. Good to see you, Taylor. Good to see you as well. Uh, so far, Alabama's 4-2-1. and one. Yes. Um, not a bad start. Not a bad start. Might could have been a little better. Of course. But tell me right now as you get ready for a home game tomorrow against North Texas at 1 o'clock, where's this team at? Um, well, we're happy to be back, of course. Um, we've been on the road back-to-back -back a lot. Um, we just got back from a game against Jacksonville. Um, but, you know, we're ready to be home and in front of our own fans um, and get a win. I know this is Coach West Hart's fifth season. When he got here, he kind of had to rebuild the program, but now he's recruited you and others. This, this is his program. This is his team. You know exactly what to expect. You know the style of play. You recruited to play this style of play. How comfortable is it for you? Um, this is my third year, so like I'm extremely comfortable. Uh, we have a huge freshman class that just came in, mm -hmm. and this is the first year, I think, since I've been here that the bench has been so deep that the level doesn't drop right. as soon as they come on the field, and that's really special for a team. Coach Hart has gotten this – program into the NCAA tournament before. I, I know first things first, you have the SEC season making the SEC tournament, but you got a young team, as you said, a lot of freshmen. Potentially, is this a team that you think is good enough to make it into the NCAA tournament? Absolutely. Um, the last time we went was my freshman year, and that was the first time in like 30 mm -hmm. years. So like that was a great experience for me. Um, and I know our seniors, we want to do it for them, and we want to get them back because we have a lot of potential this year, and we definitely are more than capable of getting there. I described you earlier as the heart and soul of, of this team, and that's what I was told, that you are your leader, you're a player that the other players rally around. What does that mean to you when you hear that? I think it's special. It's really cool to have the underclassmen look up to you. Um, and, you know, I would do anything for the girls on my team, and those girls are my family. And, you know, like, this is something that we all care a lot about, and we all have the same goal, so it's really easy to get behind it. All right, I mentioned North Texas tomorrow, 1 o'clock. Uh, I know it's fun for the players when there's a big crowd. Of and this is an opportunity to get that fifth win. So of course, the, yeah. The next game to me is always the biggest, right? Of course, of course. It's something to look forward to. And, you know, like I said, being back at home is just such a good feeling to be here. So. And finally, it is your coach's birthday It is today. his birthday. we got to give him a birthday Happy shout out. Happy birthday, Wes. <laughs> I hope you're watching. <laughs> is he keeping it secret how old he is? You know what? He's 20. He doesn't look a day he, over 20. He really doesn't. Truly, I mean, truly. as I put my glasses back on so I can see the <laughs> teleprompter, he looks 20. Happy birthday, Coach. Thank you so much, Of Taylor. course. Thanks for having me. Good luck this season. All right. We're not done with Crimson Tide kickoff. Not by a long shot. When we come back, we'll discuss a familiar foe for the Crimson Tide that's playing nowadays in the Black and Garnett. That and more when CTKO returns. Did I handle that tease okay? Uh, she was trying to tell me some. She was telling me to toss the break. Yeah. What, did I not toss the break? Okay. All right, thanks, Taylor. Thank you so much. Make sure somebody gets that microphone from you. Okay.
And welcome back to Crimson Tide Kickoff presented by Alpha Insurance. I'm Gary Harris. Although Bama and South Carolina haven't faced off in uh, nine years, there's one Gamecock who knows the Tide very, very well. Tavian Feaster is a running back for South Carolina, but he spent the majority of his undergraduate career at Clemson, three years in fact, where he faced Alabama in three straight seasons. Feaster is a grad transfer who racked up over 1,300 yards and 15 touchdowns as a member of the Clemson Tigers, but decided to join the Tigers' bitter rival in Columbia for his final season of eligibility. He knows the Tide well, and while he reflects fondly on his success against Alabama as a member at Clemson, he knows what's in store for his new team this afternoon. Oh, yeah, those incredible wins, great teams, uh, you know, but what's understood ain't, ain't got to be explained. You know, uh, we're out there and we executed and we got our job done. Uh, Going to be a tough, fast, uh, physical team, uh, very disciplined guys, um, and they're going to bring it every play. So just go out there and give it your best and, uh, you know, can't let your guard down. It's going to be a four-quarter game. And we mentioned at the top of the show that Carolina's freshman quarterback Ryan Holinsky is the younger brother of the late Washington State quarterback Tyler Holinsky. There's no doubt Ryan is playing for his brother when he's on the field, but today everyone in the stadium is being asked to pay tribute to the elder Holinsky brother. In the third quarter, fans of both South Carolina and Alabama are being asked to stand and raise up three fingers, a tribute to Holinsky, who wore that number at Washington State. The tribute is a nod to Holinsky's hope an organization founded by the Holinsky family to help raise money and awareness to help destigmatize mental illness. If all participate, this could certainly be a very touching and moving tribute. Time now for final check of our game day forecast. CTKO's Daniel Davis is standing by with a look at the weather. Danielle. Gary, it is a beautiful afternoon here in central Alabama. Tuscaloosa right now, 89, so it's a hot day. Plenty of sunshine out there on the Walk of Champions right now, though. And all across the southeast, we are pretty warm. 87 here in Tuscaloosa, 90 in Jackson. But hey, in Columbia, South Carolina, they are in the low 80s still. So going to be a nicer game there in South Carolina. So breaking down the future cast, mostly dry this afternoon. A few pop-up showers going to be in more northeast Alabama at the start of the game and again a few pop up showers as you move throughout your evening your game forecast we're looking at the mid 90s here in Tuscaloosa and by the end of the game clouds increasing with a few scattered showers possible and we're still only in the low 90s Gary. Thanks Danielle and that's going to do it for us today here on Crimson Tide kickoff you can catch a replay of the program anytime at WVA23.com for our crew in Columbia and all of us here at WVA23. I'm Gary Harris. Thanks for watching. A reminder that we'll have the Nick Saban press conference following the game and then I'll be with you tonight at 10 with a full report from Columbia on the Tide and the Gamecocks. Enjoy your game day afternoon. Roll Tide everybody.